that we are also recording now too and uh and anything that you as with everyone that i interview anything that you don't want to go on the record it's all right you're an old pro you've done so many interviews <laughs> by now i'm sure and that's not a i just mean that like i saw where you uh you did the uh, interview with uh periscope studios uh-huh yeah I, in fact i was just uh, watching that today there's oh. between that and your blogs you've put a lot of information out um <laughs> Well, that's that's a huge. Um, that's in some ways that's the biggest, the, the the most challenging job, I guess I would say, that I have I of all the different jobs that I have to do to to be doing Trekker right now, and self publishing it and all that stuff. The biggest task is to is to get the word out to people who haven't heard of Trekker before, or maybe have heard of Trekker but aren't aware that I'm running Kickstarters and self publishing and, and all that sort of stuff. It seems like every campaign I run. I spend basically 30 days doing nothing but talking about Trekker on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, when I go to conventions, whatever. And still, I'll come down to the last day or two of the show and people will say, oh, I didn't know you were running a campaign or, oh, you're doing Trekker again? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, I mean it, it's a little bit maddening because I feel that I'm right. on the rooftops, but, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just one voice and I'm me shouting from a rooftop in Cleveland, but somebody in New Mexico ain't hearing me, you know, so... Um, so you're sort of tormented by the um, by the notion that you could always be doing something more or something smarter or something differently. And that way, a handful of more Trekker readers would find your book and, and fall in love with your character. So it's it's um, you have to guard against driving yourself completely nuts. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. It really helps. It looks like you live close to the ocean. I know it's not as warm. Up, uh, well, anyone who really thinks the Pacific is warm until you get to Mexico is they've never tried it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's chilly. No, it yeah, I, um, um, we just moved here about a year ago. And, All uh, right. Yeah. So we love. Um, well, I in particular, I just love to just go out and take walks on the on the beach and you know just listen to the waves and look at the ocean. It's a great way to sort of you know. You throw you 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 you're forced out of your own thinking in a way. You just look at that ocean and you just can't think of anything else for a few minutes. It's it's like enforced meditation or something like that. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And yeah. uh, you know, it's said that that we uh, that we can't solve a problem with the same mindset that began to the perceive creative. it. So once you start, <laughs> yeah, it's like so. I think that uh, those walks that take you out of yourself you you always come back with with something new and you know and you feel the confidence that you need i'm sure we could have a beautiful conversation entirely just about managing ego i i, I not to cast dispersions but i, I get an impression you're, you're a very layered fellow you know it's like that your 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 comics talk you know they they deal with uh not, not only something about futurism but issues mm -hmm. about a uh, coming of age um and uh of uh, themes from violence and uh, it's there's a very philosophical undertone that makes it an incredible pleasure well because that's, it's executed that's, well too well thanks well that, that's great to hear um um I, I don't know if we can want to put this the thing i'm going to say next within the context of our conversation but um part of the impetus i had when i was coming up with trekker um part of the impetus behind it was I knew I wanted to, if I was going to do a story of my own, um, it was going to have to be about something more than just the, the level that the 12 year old of me loves. The 12 year old of me loves, you know, uh, swamp monsters and spaceships crash landing on barren foreign planets and raw gunfights and you know all those those cool swashbuckly adventure sorts. i love that stuff you know i and but i knew for a series to um to hold my interest and and um be able to continue to inspire me to put all the work into it that you have to do to create a comic book you know one after another and stuff that the, there had to be in some way uh, more substance to it than just oh that's a cool story idea you know it had to be about something and and the thing that you mentioned there is it's 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 this young woman's gradual evolution as a human being as a character and self-discovery and and evolving and becoming a human being sort of you know uh, if she can make the if she can survive the trip and also part of it was about 
about violence, like you said, it's about the the role of violence and and the the uses that we put it to, and whether there's alternatives and 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 I don't like like I think like a good artist, I don't have answers. I just ask questions, and the, I let the stories yes. take the characters where the story takes them, and then I let the readers and myself included sort of draw our own conclusions from the experiences that we have with those characters because I felt. I come to feel, you know, from from very early on, it just seems like if you're writing a story, and you definitely have like, like, I'm going to deliver the message of this. The, the moral of the story is this or whatever. That's not art. That's to me. That's propaganda. That's trying to. That's like writing a uh, a persuasive essay or something like that. And that's not what I'm about because I, I just want to explore these characters and the richness and the complexity of the. The world. I, I often say about Trekker that it started its life as a black and white series, and that, that's perfect because Mercy starts with a sort of very black and white view of what her life is. I shoot people, I get paid for it, and just keeping it on a very simple elemental level, that's what she would like life to be like. But it's not. Life is much more subtle and complicated and nuanced, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. So that's a long response to your <laughs> statement there, but yeah, I guess right. I just say I'm really glad that. Uh, that a lot of what I put into the series, you know, the, the readers get that because I'm always pleasantly surprised, I guess I'd say, because I never know when I'm writing a story, if it's if it's coming out, you know, if it's getting across what I want it to. That's true. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a chance that you take it and something new, a new piece of art is created by the creator, the work, and then the new thing that happens when someone's reading it and, yeah. and participating yeah. in it, the way that that reader brings it to life. It's kind of a, a third creation, all its own. And that's where the magic happens, really, is that, that you know, the, the, what, what happens in that gap between what I'm thinking and doing and what you are perceiving and how you're interpreting it for yourself. And that's, that's where art, it becomes magical, I guess. <laughs> that's awesome. Ron, let me take it from the top then. How did, sure. When I ask how did Trekker first come to your mind, I wonder, was the first drawing of her, which is seen in your omnibus, Yes, right. Is it the, the was that the spark impulse that called you to say, "Hey, Ron, make a retro futuristic world for her," or was this sketch the culmination of of a search for a lead character for such a world? You know, did you already want to tell a Flash Gordon kind of story? You just didn't have the lead character that you wanted, or did you? Which way did it work? I wonder. Um, well, it was probably more the the latter. I think I um, mm -hmm. I started off with with um th this blank slate of what would i if i were to create my sort of my dream project you know the the, the story that i would like to, to tell the most what would that look like and so i started to you know think of some of the elements so it was on that sort of conceptual level i knew i wanted it to be a science fiction story because i had the opportunity to work on a couple of science fiction things um in comics and 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 when i work on those i knew i was lucky then because um, there weren't a lot of science fiction being done in, in comics back then. And mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that because I love I love science fiction ever since I was a kid. Um, but I knew that comics, especially then, was, was mostly a superhero sort of thing, you know. Um, so when I had a chance to do something like sci-fi and try to emulate my my some of my art heroes, you know, um, Wally Wood, Al Williamson, Flash Gordon by Alex Raymond, that kind of stuff. Well, I jumped at the chance. So so I knew I knew the basic the basic genre. That yeah, that came in pretty quickly, um, and I knew because I I came up working uh, and learning from working with and learning from Joe Kubert and that sort of action adventure story that had like a visceral appeal to it. I knew that that was kind of going to be that was my wheelhouse too, as opposed to something really sort of esoteric and a you know an abstract piece or something like that. Um, yeah. So action adventure, and I thought, and, and if and if it has a character who uh, can roam around a lot and go to a lot of different sort of settings and situations. And that brings a lot of environment, a lot of variety into the stories. Good for me, you know, as a creator to, to have new, new meat to chew on from one story to the next, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and a good variety for the readers too. So, so the idea about a bounty hunter seemed like that's somebody who there's the old wild west sort of thing about an individual character out there and, and a variety of different journeys that that character can go on. And so that sort of became a piece of it too. And I also knew I wanted it to be a, 
the female lead character from early on because again something that wasn't happening in comics very much i had a chance to do the backup uh series in the warlord comic book at dc for a while <clears throat> a couple of years before that it was called yes. the baron earth it was written by gary Cohn, who is a writer that isn't as well known as i think he should be but um gary uh dreamt up the basic concept and he and i developed it but it was um a science fiction series. Now, Gary's vision was much more of like a an Edgar Rice Burroughs sort of version of sci-fi, um, but it had a female lead character, uh, and and um, and it was it was so cool to have the the female character not be like the the sidekick or the the love interest or something like that, but she was the central character. She drove the narrative, and that was such a fresh thing to do in comics than that I had experienced up until that point, and it just sort of opens up. A sort of a different sort of emotional landscape that you can have your main character explore than 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 you could generally do with the male character Th that sort of stuff was in my head and thinking too so all those elements were there at the beginning of when i was when i was coming up with trekker and um so like i've been on been on a couple of walks and letting some of these things ruminate and then i said now it's time to start putting some stuff down on paper um and and so i just sort of started pushing the pencil around on on the page um, gesturing in like a rough pose for a character that would try to have a certain sense of attitude or, at, you know, something like that. And then um, I knew that I wanted a character who um, who was sort of dressed appropriately for her job. So there yes. would be a certain amount of gear and pads and straps and, and weaponry on her so that she would look like an action character like a bounty hunter as opposed to looking like you know uh a chorus girl or something you know like a lot of female characters that were designed back in the 60s 70s and 80s had a certain look to them and i wanted trekkie to be i wanted her to be attractive you know i wanted her to be sexy but 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 i also wanted her at the same time to be a great balance between those things because every artist likes to draw attractive women as far as i know but also a, a believable character so that i wouldn't have to apologize to women that look to the series that's what and, i was thinking i mean yeah, and, and that i would be able to sort of believe in my own stories that i was telling you know i was trying to create a character and a world that people could look at and and you could buy into it you wouldn't have to dis suspend disbelief too much beyond what you do anytime you're reading a science fiction action adventure comic i guess <laughs> i think it was an excellent choice i i you know when i ask about um about what your uh about what your interactions uh when the first when the comic first came out and you were uh, going to conventions and, uh mm -hmm. first talking to you know getting your first impressions about it uh i i know that one thing surely was like meeting women that uh that identified in some way or, or at least felt proud you know that that they uh that they that they uh, like you said it's a character you didn't have to apologize for um, yeah it's interesting because she wears a lot of she has a lot of defenses about her you know she's a very closed off person as people yeah. go. right yeah. yeah that was important too that um that she um would like to see herself, she would like to be sort of like an implacable sort of, you know, bounty hunting machine sort of thing, like a yeah. Terminator or something, you know. Um, and those characters are compelling to look at, you know, and, 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 but they're not, there's no dimensionality to them, you know, they're just two dimensional things. And, and of course, the whole, the whole thing, like, as I said from the beginning of the series is more than anything else, more than any of the trappings of it or whatever, it's about a per, it's about a character and and exploring her so there's got to be depths and there's got to be evolution and change and maturity over the course of the series or it's a pointless gesture that i'm doing here so yeah the idea that she starts off and she is very much closed in she she has relationships with with men but it's they're you know it's sort of at arm's length sort of you know she's always got to be in control and she's uh, that sort of stuff um so and uh from the very first eight page chapter we see mercy and she's out there being a badass and shooting up the bad guys and then she goes back to her crappy little apartment that she lives in in the middle of the city and inside the apartment there's this scruffy old pet domesticated fox that she has named scuff yes sir scuff yeah <laughs> and and the reason i i wanted to include that 
is that there was no reason that an implacable killing machine bounty hunter would have a pet fox. You know, the only reason she has pet fox is there is more to her, right? You know, I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. the idea to let the the readers know right off the bat there's more going on underneath the surface than Mercy is aware of or even cares to, you know, That's acknowledge. That's a good point. I had there. Um, she still wants it, to nurture something, even though her 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 career is about you know no no nonsense you know uh, bounties and sometimes you know they're fighting to the death even you know oh, yeah, she absolutely. still wants to nurture life yeah um and that's the stuff that that that's the stuff that that gets me the most excited about telling the stories like i said on the on the, on the 12 year old level i loved on the the cool gear and the, the monsters and the alien worlds and all that sort of that's all great you know but um the thing that keeps it a live process for me um that keeps me engaged in it and committed to it is trying to just enrich and depict that inner life of the of the character and and make her more sort of more believable someone that we know more about and care more about uh we can get exasperated with her when she does something stupid or cruel or whatever you know but we i would hope that we can identify with her yeah i've done stupid stuff too too or mm -hmm. my best friend said that same thing one time and you know that sort of thing because if you believe in some level that mercy is a real character you're going to want to keep coming back to the next issue and see what what she's doing next and what kind of trouble is she getting into this time? Has she learned anything? Is she, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, I think as a storyteller, nothing, uh, nothing beats the accomplishment of having, having a reader have your character come alive in their mind. I love it. That's, that, that's my drive too, is, you know, to bring people that joy and stretch in their imagination. It's, right. it's amazing to be part of somebody's mind to be part of their inner life with something that you created it, it like you said it's like magic yeah um, i was asking about what was it like reading the letters and meeting the fans at the conventions oh right i yeah. wondered like what characteristics and plot threads were resonating with them too i know that's sort of like three questions in one but yeah boy it's uh, of course going back to those early days it's it's a uh, it's a little while ago now so i don't remember a lot of that stuff but one i have one vivid memory that i'll start with and that's i was um I was at a San Diego comic convention and this would have, this would have been like 1987, maybe 1988, somewhere in there. And honestly, back then there were very few women that would go to comic conventions. If it was almost literally that if there was a woman at the convention, you were aware of it <laughs> because it was just, it was a guy zone pretty much. Um, but I, I, I very distinctly remember one guy coming up to me uh, and, and he he thanked me for creating Trekker and he said, this is the only comic book that I can get my girlfriend to read. And um, I took that as a tremendous compliment. You know, I mean, it's also sort of an indictment of <laughs> maybe about a lot of comics being done than maybe. I don't know. That's but, true too in context. Yeah. But then, you know, it, even with that context aside, it's like that was a, a genuine accomplishment. Um, and plus it's cool because, you know, when, when I first got married, um, we started, of it, we sort of uh, gravitated towards my comics that I had. We even bought some for a dime while we were on our honeymoon. And, <laughs> yeah, comics for a dime is so funny, and uh, and, and they uh, it's like it's a it's a beautiful bond, you know, to be able to take something that had been part of just your very own private life, maybe shared with a friend here and there, you know, but for someone you love to be part of it, that was it's amazing. So I'm glad yeah. you created something like that. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, one of my favorites is uh, when when Trekker returned after her original series in uh, DHCP uh, numbers 20 through 22, Vincent's share. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you never waste making an adventure a formative thing. That's something you're <laughs> talking about. Every episode progresses the character in some way. Her plot changes and the way that she's thinking about everything is changing. Yeah. So figuring out corners to cut, Mercy's taken some reckless chances to this point. Like when she takes the body uh, guard job to to get fair home, and then <laughs> she's in the setup. You know? But she's always left us with something to consider thinking about. You know, an allowance that is her central inner conflict, mm -hmm. uh, a genuine payoff to that plot thread. And yeah. I wondered if, when you did Vincent share, 
did you think that that was going to be the end of Trekker at that time? Was there a time that it seemed like that that Trekker was over? Um, no, not in my no, not in my mind. I mean, uh, there, I knew that at the time that that was when we were, you know, um, we we're going to have to bring that, that initial run of stories to a close. There, in fact, Vincent Stair share when I started working on that that was going to just be issue number seven of the the series I see but around that time the 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 economics the, the finances were, were changing in the I think the initial the initial black and white boom had it started to soften somewhat so we knew that Trekker wasn't selling good enough that they were going to Dark Horse was going to be able to continue to pay me my, a full rate to be able to do the the mm. books um and um and I wasn't able to, I, I couldn't afford to keep doing it for a lot less money because I had a young family mouths to feed at the time. So yeah. I knew I was going to have to to um, gear down working on Trekker uh, to to take on other work, you know, for DC and stuff again to oh, yeah. keep making a living. But that said, I, I never once said, well, I'm done with Trekker now. I mean, my intention had never wavered from telling the rest of this journey uh when i first was creating the series like i said i my intention was has been every day since to start the woman the young woman in one place take her through a lot of adventures a lot of evolutionary steps in a very sort of gradual you know incremental way and eventually the story reaches reaches a conclusion it reaches like a like a good novel or a trilogy of novels because it's a pretty long one but you get to the end point and there's a resolution there's a some sort of basic primal questions have been addressed and you reach a satisfactory you know resolution to that that point um and we're not there yet um uh, and i know where it's going and it's going to take a while to get there but during all the years when i was only able to work on trekker sporadically where there was a 12-year period of time where i didn't work on trekker at all um it was a very long hiatus, but anytime I'd be at a convention, it seems like just about every show, one or two people would at some point in the weekend come up to me and they'd say, when are you going to do more Trevor, you know? And uh, and I, I was always say to them, the next story is scripted out or at least the outlines there. I'm just waiting for a chance to be able to draw it, waiting for the time to draw it, waiting for the right opportunity. So, um, uh, no, I, I never really... Uh, would accept the fact that oh maybe I'm not going to be doing any more Trekker. That was it, it. It shortly after I created it. In fact, probably even as I was working on it from the very beginning, I, I distinctly remember sort of saying to myself, "If by the end of my career the one thing that people associate my name with most is Trekker, I will sign that contract in a second. You know that was uh, so. Um, and I had a whole story I wanted to tell there. So yeah, I've just been sort of <laughs> really stubborn about it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And I, I feel like that uh, I, I think that you often feel like it paid off to stick with that, you know, that it'll in the middle of all of that hard work. It's like, you know, I'm just glad to have this. I'm glad this is happening still. You're yeah. just, not many people get to get to uh, to take a thing that, that they decided on that they're making, you know, and, and make that their product. That is really remarkable, you know? Yeah. I, 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 I never lose sight of the fact that I have been, I mean, it's not that I haven't worked hard, you know, and, and been definitely making, and went but, to school too. I mean, wow. Yeah. And experience, yeah. yeah. But, but I have never lo lost sight of the fact that I have had a lot of tremendous good, you know, fortunate breaks or things going my, my way meeting the right person at the right time, all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of, the stars had to line up very, very well for me to be in the position that I'm at now. Um, and, and I'm I'm extremely grateful that for all the breaks that I've had along the way, just like I'm extremely grateful to the, the readers who have discovered Trekker or remembered it all these years or have recently discovered it and and go out of their way to support it on the, on the, the crowdfunding Kickstarter campaigns. Um, and, and keep it going. I can't do it without them. And uh, yeah, it's just, um, it, it's, it, it's kind of hard to express how, how much that means, you know, and what that means exactly. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm glad that people, they surely they feel that gratitude and that makes it a little bit easier to let go of those hard earned shekels, you know, <laughs> it's like when you realize that you're kind of helping a guy fight for a cause in a way, you know, I'm yeah, I think ask, so, yeah. 
when did the story of her training come to you? And uh, were Karch and Angus born uh, for the purposes that they served, or did you discover these things about them when you created the small support cast around her origin? Um, gosh, that again, that goes back a ways now. I think that that sort of came about, that part of the story sort of came about when I was, um, when I was coming up with that, with that story. Um, I, I, I wow. knew, you know, we'd started the, the series sort of kind of in the middle of things, right? We, we don't start with, we don't start at square one with Mercy being born or whatever like that, you know, um, mm -hmm. we, we start where she's already, uh, she's already working as a functioning bounty hunter and she's set up in the city, New Yalaf, and, and uh, she's in the middle of relationships with people and, and that sort of stuff. So after we'd been, after I'd been doing that for, I guess, uh, whatever, a year or two, um, I thought, okay, now let's, let's go back and, and where does she get some of these remarkable abilities she's got? So it, it was time to create, for lack of a better phrase, her origin story. So I called it Sins of Our Fathers or Sins of the Fathers. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, um, I, I sort of, I hadn't had that planned out beforehand, if I remember right, very, you know, in any meaningful way. So then it was coming up with what would be the origin story that would make sense, that would fit with the rules that have already established for the series, because that's always been a big thing to me. <clears throat> um, from the beginning, I tried to to create a, a, a set of parameters to work within that I could always be consistent with. So I'm not changing the rules of the series or something like that and uh, revising things. So um, it just seemed like that would work. Um, Angus was a character uh, that was you know, just based on um, some some sort of mentor type characters that I'd seen in movies. You know, sort of in some ways, sort of the art, the crusty old, you know, battle scarred guy, literally scarred in Angus's case, maimed even. Um, yeah. Who who is um, who is cantankerous, but also you know, kind of has the wisdom of the years and generations <laughs> in him. Uh, and then Karch, it just started. It, she needed to have a she needed to have a first a first lover, you know, and um, uh, it just sort of coalesced into a story where where the where the threads came together nicely for a good climax there. Yeah, that's a really great story. I love the uh, the uh, the conversations about the uh, about the price of uh, of vengeance and uh, and, and the difference uh, even between vengeance and justice, too. Mm -hmm. um, the really hard call that Angus made, the the insanely inhumane call that he had to make. To uh, it's like I can I can stop this alien invasion, but the, that ship is not going to get clear. And, and then just like that, it turns out that's Karch's father, the captain on that ship. You know, it was just yeah. I mean, you, as as a as a writer, um, I think one of the most compelling concepts you can come up with is something where you put a character in a moral quandary. You know, where there's no there's no there's no easy you know black and white right and wrong decision. They have to choose between two evils or whatever you want to call it. And they, you know, their their own values are are called into serious question. And and it's almost like they've got an unsolvable riddle, but they have to make a choice. Um, and I mean, it just just that's a compelling story there. Okay, they've made that choice. What does that mean? What's going to happen next? Right? You know, that's mm -hmm. as I as I often say, the storyteller. I want if I can get the reader to ask one question and one question only, <laughs> then I've won. And that question is what happens next? <laughs> if I get you wanting to turn the page and seeing, you know, or picking up the next issue or whatever, and just saying, I, I want to find out what happens next with this character is what's the repercussions of that? What did Mercy learn from that decision? You know, uh, will, will this character survive that heartbreak? Um, whatever it is. So um, yeah, those kind of questions are, are the ones that, that drives all the best stories, I think. Absolutely. Well, you know, you've actually answered a lot of questions about what the revival road was like for Trekker, you know, having your um, material ready. Um, we've talked a little bit about the, the past, you know, and definitely wanted to get people involved with their, uh, like whoever's reading about this in back issue, you know, I would mm -hmm. like to, to um, engage with them on a level that's, you know, that refreshes those memories. And, yeah. You know, you know, I think that we've got some good answers here, Ron. Um, okay. I'm having a little, a little trouble with my uh, computer. And uh, so I'm hoping that 
it'll stop freaking out and and let me it's like i'm trying to to return to our our screen oh uh -huh. and make sure that it actually does uh that i can like stop record for it and everything uh as a as a backup though i also started audacity so i've got like a doll i've got like an audio recording too and i'm really oh, okay. glad i've got it just in case i have any trouble getting this uh, zoom to uh save Okay. Yeah, I'm th those those sort of technical glitches can just cause you all kinds of nightmares. I know that much. <laughs> they can. I did a little test before, uh, like last night. I was trying to use some of my uh, speakers and a setup, but we did a test with uh with Angela on Messenger and me on Messenger. We were getting a lot of feedback. It was like, thank you for helping me figure that out, and I'm so glad <laughs> I didn't have to put uh, Mr. Randall through that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um. Yeah, did you, uh, yeah, I know if, if you think that you've got enough material to work with here, that's great. If there's more questions, I got, I can. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm sure I do. It's like, I don't know how much time we've got before this thing runs out, but uh, I was going to ask you four decades now into creating Mercy St. Clair's Saga, did modern innovations and cutting edge tech uh, influence what appears in your retro futuristic setting? Um. In the setting, a little bit. I mean, I've some of the um, some of the uh, look of some of the newer science fiction movies and TV shows. Little bits of those things seep in around the edges. Spaceship designs, a little bit of the tech that they use in Trekker is a little bit more influenced by that. I have a few of those more modern accents coming in. Um, but I try to keep that stuff um, kind of on the minimal. I mean, from the very beginning, Trekker had some pretty high blown, high concept stuff, you know, the Babel Canon and things like that. So I have a, the I have a pretty good range that I can work in uh, by incorporating some new ideas without it seeming like it's too jarring, I think, for Trekker uh, viewers and stuff like that or readers, I should say. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I didn't know. Um, uh, I guess I was uh, I was uh, just shying away from a couple of the questions, but um, but I think you did a great job of talking about how you know thinking up her stories and the process of choosing which to tell. Uh, that's such a that could be a big answer, you know, like you know figuring out what do I want to tell about her and in what order did I want to tell. It, it seems like a lot of her. Uh, seems like a lot of her story came to you early on and that you've been working it out for a long time? Um, yes, in a way the, like I said, the basic concept yeah. was there, but but mm -hmm. um, while I knew that I wanted the series to start kind of with these, um, I guess I'd call them small scale adventures. You know, she's, she's out trying to track down one bad guy or try to foil one sort of gang, you know, plot in the city of New Gala. But as the stories go on, she travels further afield from the city. Uh, out into the blasted wastelands, you know, then she comes back home, then she goes into outer space, uh, and then she comes back home. But each of these journeys shapes her a little bit or influences her. And they not only that, but they they give the reader some more indications of the bigger wheels that are that are spinning, you know, out out in the stars, so to speak, that are shaping the course of the civilization. And the idea is to gradually come to the sense that you know, Mercy is going to be called to step onto a larger stage and become more of a sort of a character of destiny, um, to use an overused phrase. Um, so while I had some of that in mind in broad strokes from the beginning of the series, mm -hmm. um, this developing it specifically step by step and knowing where and how a lot of that's going to happen, a, a lot of that didn't come around until um, I was on one of those hiatus breaks with Trekker. And when I was getting ready to come back to it, um with the intention of now i'm going to i'm going to stick with it and sustain it until i get to the end of the journey that's when i really sat down and um and blocked out what the rest of that journey was going to look like at least in a basic sort of skeletal outline sort of form enough that i have a sense of the shape and the the scope and the timeline um and then i was able to be at peace with it and i said okay now i've got that down i don't have to have that level of anxiety then it's just a question of saying, okay, the next big beat in Mercy's life is X. So what's oh. a good sort of what's a sort of a good self-contained action adventure story that I can tell that incorporates that next sort of 
rung in the ladder of her journey, so to speak. Awesome. So that's where, so, so I'm, I'm in what I consider the sweet spot. I have the, I have enough of the outline of the rest of the series figured out that I'm, that I'm confident that I, I can make it work, but there's enough um, flexibility or enough, you know, you know, blanks blank slates in, in each of those stories that if i'm struck by a bit of inspiration a conversation that i've had or a passage i read in a book or something i've seen in a comic or on a tv show I, oh i can slip a little bit of that into mercy's world and what a uh -huh. character or, yeah. or a set piece or a, a, a twist or something I can, I can take that and you know uh, modify it or whatever you know customize it for mercy's world but that would be a cool thing that could fit into this story that i've got coming up so uh, like I said, I think it's a combination of uh, knowing where I'm going to go, but also there's enough. I, I have plenty of room for uh, inspiration to strike. And yeah, and, uh, so it's still a creative process for yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still improvising. You're not just carrying out old orders or an old yeah, I, I, it, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, what's the fresh way to put this? Exactly. If I had the entire series really planned out to the to the nth degree right now, I would just kind of feel like almost. I'm just going through the motions, fulfilling an obligation to get there. But oh, I sort of, sort of still feel like I'm on a bit of a creative journey where I'm discovering with each new story. Oh, that would be a cool bit. And I can incorporate that this way, you know? So um, it keeps it pretty fresh and exciting for me um, without, without having, when I first began that I had a lot of anxiety about what am I, what am I going to do in the next issue? You know? <laughs> oh, um, wow. Yeah. Cause, cause a lot of it, I was just, uh, cause I started a dark horse as a few of the, you know, the, the little, um, serialized story in dark horse presents but then very quickly they wanted to turn it into its its own a, a book you know and of course i was not going to say no to that but i was saying mm -hmm. well i've never done this before so wow um, how it, exciting it, slash nerve-wracking that's great. yeah exactly exciting slash nerve-wracking so um so now it's 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 quite a few years down the road i'm a more you know i'm a more experienced writer um and i obviously i know these this world and these characters a lot better now after having lived with them for like 35 years or whatever mm -hmm. so um i'm in a place where i feel like i got a pretty good handle on all that sort of stuff and, and but i'm still excited to, to to discover some new ideas and throw some new things into the pot with each issue so it's a uh, i'm in a good spot <laughs> absolutely oh well I've really had a lot of fun with this, and uh, I think that uh, Zoom might uh, kick us off any second, anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like it's uh, it was uh, scheduled till four forty-five because I've got like just the basic version of Zoom. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've had to do a couple of things differently. Um, just having a little computer trouble. So. Yeah. No, no problem. It sounds like we've had a pretty good conversation. If you feel like you've got enough material to work with, then I'm happy. <laughs> oh, I'll bet that I do. I really bet yeah. that I do. It, it's great. The only thing I would even try to, to follow up was, uh, I, I guess I was a little bit curious about, um, about why, uh, about why Mercy, well, I, I kind of look at it like this. I don't know that I feel like that Mercy's sexuality changed. I think that she fell in love with a person. <sighs> Mm -hmm. do you feel the same it's that it's a uh, yeah absolutely I, I i don't think um i think like i say at the beginning mercy doesn't doesn't know very much about herself yeah um so she's sort of going through the motions oh, i should be dating this kind of a person or i should be doing that you know uh -huh. and uh, you know the guy the the her boyfriend at the first story is, is named paul he's a cop and he's a good guy he's a yeah. he's a good guy you know i like paul a lot pays for um, a nice vacation Boy, I'll, I'll never forget that. She decides to, to, to do bounty hunter business. That's why she agrees to the vacation ticket. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that made her but, so uh, different than any superhero. <laughs> right, exactly. But, um, but you know, Molly's always been there. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I just think it took Mercy a little while to figure out why. Uh, you know, why, what, what did Mercy have in common? Molly's a musician. She just, you know, she, she runs a music 